Hello, I'm Kathy Spahn, and I'm the President and CEO of Helen Keller International, and I also serve on the Executive Committee of IAPB. And I'm here today with Dave Friedman, who is the Alfred Sommer Professor of Ophthalmology at Johns Hopkins University and is also the director of the Dana Center for Preventive Ophthalmology there, as well as senior ophthalmologist for Helen Keller International. And we're here today in the first formal meeting of IPB's new working group on diabetic retinopathy. And Dave has played a key role in this. So I want to start with a very basic question, Dave, which is, why did IAPB need to create a working group on diabetic retinopathy? Diabetes is a global problem that's increasing dramatically in the last decade and going to continue to do so as people age and diabetes becomes more prevalent. Uh, we're seeing more and more diabetic eye disease. Uh, in the past, we've emphasized other conditions that are a bit easier to treat than mm -hmm. diabetic eye disease. Uh, but now there's a greater emphasis and knowledge on diabetic retinopathy and the problems it causes with vision. Uh, so now the whole group, the whole IAPB working group, uh, is trying to share lessons learned in their diabetic retinopathy programs uh, to consider future collaborations and ways in which we can use our resources mm -hmm. more efficiently going ahead. So you said that diabetic retinopathy is more complicated to treat than other eye issues. When you factor into that that we're focused on developing countries, what are the extra challenges in working in the kinds of countries IAPB focuses on? Diabetic retinopathy is uh, a disease that has no symptoms at all. When you develop it, you don't know you have it. You might not even be aware of very severe disease. Mm. Uh, blood vessels can grow in the eye that lead to bleeding and can subsequently lead to blindness. There can be swelling in the back of the eye that can also harm the vision. Uh, but for most people who have diabetic retinopathy, there's no symptom whatsoever. Uh, when you think about explaining this in a setting of mm -hmm poverty where people are coping with so many other issues and they have no symptoms, it's extremely complicated. In addition, when you screen people for diabetic eye disease, about nine out of 10 won't need anything done. So you bring them out, you take them for whatever testing you're doing, there's costs involved in that, both in their time and in, in the money that it takes to do the testing, and then you tell them they're fine, but they have to come back again in a year. So that's a very complicated part. And finally, the treatments we provide generally don't improve your vision. They just prevent vision loss. So for somebody to come in, go through all of that, and see no benefit to themselves uh, requires a really well thought out educational process so that the patients understand that they're benefiting even though they don't feel a benefit. So you've got all these odds against you. You've got people who don't know they need to get their eyes checked. You have people who may get them checked once and not want to come back. You've got people who you recommend treatment for and that's not a fun experience for them. <laughs> so if you were a billionaire, or maybe just a millionaire, and you had some funds you could invest, what's the highest point of leverage? Where would you put resource dollars to try to move the needle, as it were? Yeah, I think there are two areas. I think one is um, if people manage their diabetes better, just their diabetes, mm -hmm. they're much less likely to get eye disease from diabetes. So I think there needs to be an enormous effort placed on both preventing diabetes and uh, decreasing the blood sugar of patients with diabetes. In terms of eye health itself, uh, I really think we need to uh, develop you know, relatively robust and less expensive approaches to screening for the disease. Ways in which we can image the eye uh, at low cost and see patients efficiently and effectively that's where the money has to go. It has to go into developing those systems. There's no one thing, there's no one great cure, mm -hmm. but it's all about uh, investing in better logistics and treatment plans. And in terms of the equipment that we've talked a bit about and better screening equipment, again in a developing country context, are there differences? So if you're a regular manufacturer and you make something that works in London, that works in New York City, What's the difference between, let's say, having that camera work in Sub-Saharan right. Africa? Um, you know, when we do screening in the field, we often are in settings where we have to move the equipment because mm -hmm. you can't always stay in one spot and wait for them to come. Uh, most of the equipment in London or Baltimore stays put. It's in the clinic. It never moves. We need very sturdy, well-built equipment that's not very expensive. Currently, a Fundus camera can cost over $30,000 to purchase. 
we need one for two thousand dollars or a thousand dollars and really that's happening uh, just like our iPhones now can take pictures that are mm -hmm. high def you can create something similar for the eye for a few thousand dollars even today and hopefully in the future we'll be able to create instruments that can be used to prevent this blindness uh, really inexpensively. So the challenge will be for that technology to accelerate as quickly as the diseases escalating <laughs> around the world. Absolutely. All right. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you.